check the moves, check the moves. Always thought we lived in a good world? No, no, not at all. The world is just terrible. <laughs> just kidding. In this video, I'd like to talk about broken societies and broken revolutions. And for my example, I'll use Haven City. Those that played the Jack and Dexter series, they'll know what kind of city it is. And those that have no clue, well, that's not a problem because I'll introduce the city and afterwards I'll ask the questions. So whether you're a boy or a girl, it doesn't matter. Just keep watching and make sure you comment in the comment section below. All right. For today's subject, I'll use Haven City as my big example. And for those that have no idea, Haven City is a city surrounded by a huge wall that lies at the bottom of large mountainous structures. And the city used to be ruled by monarchs. Or I should rather say people that were bound to the House of Mar. And the House of Mar was the ruling dynasty of Haven City, made up of descendants from the city's founder and his descendants have ruled Haven City as kings. The same way as how Belgium is being governed actually. You have the king and he's surrounded by his family and they form the monarchs. They're at the head of the state. Except that kings nowadays, they have significantly less power than they used to have 50 years ago. And I think that's for the better of all of us. Anyway, after a coup d'etat, the city changed especially in the way it was being governed. Baron Praxis banished Demus, who was a descendant himself, to the wasteland and he installed his own laws. For example, the Crimson Guard. The Crimson Guards could be compared to Haven City's military and police force and those officers were publicly known as corrupt and had terrible practices. The Crimson Guard employed brutal and tyrannical tactics to police Haven City and its citizens. The Crimson Guard did not have any civic duty or courtesy and worked solely for the Baron. They evoked random apprehensions and would kill any individual that broke civil conduct including a collision with a guard or killing a fellow citizen. And by the way, if you check the link below you'll find the top 10 of the most corrupt police forces here on earth. So it's something you should check out, it's really interesting. Anyway, you heard me using those words random apprehension. That's a practice they used a lot, especially when the underground made its debut. You see, as in most societies that are or were ruled by tyrants, it might give rise to an opposing faction. There are numerous factions here on earth that exists or has existed that were very similar to the underground. And I'll give examples of two persons I really really respect. We have for example Che Guevara who had a more aggressive way and you had Martin Luther King that tried to answer Ooh. darkness with love without violence. Anyway, the underground had a common purpose namely to dethrone the misplaced ruler and put the true heir back on the throne of Heaven City. And there were numerous men working for the underground all rebels and did not appear to have any uniform associated with them, making them hard to identify. It was even hard for the Crimson Guard to find underground fugitives as they would hold everyone within a, a sector or district under arrest for suspicion of harboring underground members. And I've heard a few stories where police officers had like the same practices. After an attack on a part of the shield wall by the metalheads, it led the Baron to not only abandon the place that is now known as the Dead Town, but it also led him to make a desperate deal. The Baron made a deal with the metalhead leader in that he would provide shipments of eco to the metalheads if they attacked the city only enough. And this deal was funded by the Baron Eco Fund, in which the Baron generated various sources of eco revenue, which included a mining operation at the strip mine and drill platform, as well as eliciting donations from citizens through propaganda. Oh, and by the way, this is how the dead town truly looks like. Not so amusing now. Is it? You've heard me mentioning metalheads, just see them as our biggest enemies, those that just want us dead. I've also mentioned the word eco, 
Eco is a dark poisonous substance with the ability to transform, infect and sometimes kill any life form or object it comes in contact with. You might think, after such a definition, why even go out and try to find eco? To understand the importance, you need to know what the eco grid is. The eco grid was the eco network which stabilized many of Haven City's functional components, such as the shield wall and the barriers around the city. So we know that eco is a limited and rather scarce energy source, and here on Earth, it's good to compare it with oil. And both eco and oil has been a huge source for conflict. You've heard me mentioning a few locations, so let's go straight to the more important ones, inside and outside the city. We'll start with the pumping st station. It's an area north of Haven City consisting of a small island, cliffs, windmills and large pipes converting seawater into fresh water for the city. It is accessible by a drainage pipe in the water slums. This is where Haven City gets its water supply. So it's a very important place. Those drainage pipes, they go through the slums and they go to every corner in the city. And the slums plus the water slums are home to many of Haven City's poorer inhabitants. It is a poor area with uneven roadways, small cramped living areas and burning, burning garbage cans. Sorry. The area reflects the strife and poverty in Haven City under Praxis rule and served as home to the underground resistance. And by the way, I tried to draw those pipes myself. I know it's not that good, but you see that everything starts from the water slums and it goes down to the ports. Other important locations are the bazaar and the gardens. The bazaar served not only as market or a trading center, but it's also where people lived. And I'd say that it's the place where the, the mid to high classes lived because you had vehicles restrictions and the place looked wealthy enough. And the gardens provides food for Heaven City. And the place where the goody goodies lived or the wealthiest, well, that's the Mar Memorial Stadium. You had Mars Tomb and you had the main districts. Clearly, you can see that those districts, they show their potential with modern buildings, pretty streets, and you can see that they care for order. And at last, we have the industrial section and the sewers. The industrial section that's mostly for factories and energy maintenance. And the sewers, well, the sewers were, were also used as a smuggling route for the more bad guys in Haven City. Except that metalheads took residence there and as a response, the Baron placed mines and turrets. To understand why I call it a broken society, it's important to, to know the relation between the Crimson Guard fortress, the underground with poverty and crime. You have to know that when people are pushed into corners and they're being oppressed, this will most likely result in crime and rebellion. That's why I find it very interesting to study the location of the underground and the Crimson Guard fortress. Both are located in the slums. For the Crimson Guard, I'd say they're even in the middle of the slums. And I understand why the underground is placed there. When poverty and crime are combined together, it leaves people with two choices. They either take part in criminal activities or try to find legal but quite limited sources of income when there are any available at all. And those people in the slums, they have less to lose than those that live at the bazaar or main districts. And even in real life, you'll find more company owners, leaders, or people with high responsibilities isolated in a certain district. So for the underground, it's very interesting to be stationed there because they'd be able to not only recruit a lot of manpower, but they'll be mo motivated to fight. And the Crimson Guards, well, they're also in the slums and they could easily deploy more officers around the fortress. That way they'd have more men to control the slums and they could bring them in because the fortress is actually a prison. That's why I call it a broken society. Because those people in the slums, they almost have nothing. And yet those police officers, 
they tried to take everything from them and by the way the slums has no access to other districts because there's a, bar a barrier there I think that those barriers were, desi were designed especially to disconnect the slums with the main districts and the industrial section now why do I call it a broken revolution after finishing Jack 2 and I saw that their revolution succeeded I thought all right well done but then when I played Jack 3 just the opening scene I saw Haven Palace collapsing. I saw streets from my hometown destroyed. The gardens changed from this to this. The armies were divided somewhere up north, somewhere down south in the port. And you had enemies that took over the industrial section so they could attack the slums or the port whenever they wanted. Places as the gardens or the bazaar were entirely destroyed which means that those people will be without food and all those pipes were also destroyed which, which means that more than half of the city will be without water and if you ever tried to flee to the sewers well the revolution of Jack 2 led to the destruction of those devices that the Baron installed and that way the metalheads took over At first I'd like to say sorry for the quality sometimes or the English. I know the video is far from being professional but the good thing is that we can throw off all the formalities and just be straight to each other. The Jack and Daxter world is very similar to ours and most of the events that happened in the game happened also in our world. And I started to think, is a revolution always worth it? I mean they took down the Baron after Jack 2, no in Jack 2 and they got rid of a big terror except that they ended up in an even bigger terror and if you compare the Baron with uh, Gaddafi or Saddam Hussein they had some things in common but after their time did their respective countries really really win something? I mean most of those countries are still in war that's why I thought is it always worth to have a revolution? And I'd say that here on Earth, we're far from living a, in a utopian world. That means there's bound to be a revolution someday. But is it always worth the case? I'd like to hear your opinions about it. Do you think there are things here on Earth that needs to be changed? Or do you think the Earth is good as it is? Just express yourselves. Tell me everything you want to tell about revolutions and about things that you'd like to see change or not. And I've got a few more questions for those that played Jack and Dexter. Do you have any suggestions of how a future Jack could be made? Tell me everything. And I'll see you in the next video.